for 3.2 seconds. I saw perfection. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hojuana and today we're covering the real power sources that spacecraft can take advantage of. This won't be an exhaustive list of every option, think of it more like an introduction that covers the bases. We start with the most abundant source of power in any solar system, its star. These balls of fusion output a gargantuan amount of energy that can be collected in a number of ways, like with photovoltaics, which directly produce electricity from photons. Solar panels are THE method for producing power in space because they're simple, easy and can fold or roll up to fit into launch vehicles. Most importantly, they can reach 100% uptime if not in close orbit. They can even achieve this on the surface of certain objects as well, like at the poles of the moon. They do have their downsides though. Solar panel efficiency drops as they get hotter, which isn't great when they spend all their lives being warmed by the sun. Their output also degrades over time, and they can be damaged by things like micrometeoroid impacts, reducing performance even further. But at least older panels can be relatively easily augmented or replaced, as with the IRO panels on the ISS, which output almost as much as their older siblings back when they were new, despite being half the size. The sun can also be used as a heat source. The light can be focused into a small area to run one of the many thermodynamic cycles there are to get motion out of it, which in turn drives an electrical generator. Something to note is that those thermodynamic cycles have cold sides, so your spacecraft is going to need radiators. You can also use the energy to directly heat up a propellant like water. As it boils, it turns to steam and expands, which can be directed through a nozzle to make a thruster. It's not super efficient, but that matters way less when you can just mine water ice from asteroids. Lastly, the kinetic energy of photons or the solar wind can be utilised, like with solar sails that get thrust from photons bouncing off them. Capturing energy from the solar wind is a bit more involved since you need an onboard power source to run a magnetic or electric sail. The downside of any type of solar power is that there is a maximum amount of energy per square metre that can be harvested. So to get more power you need to cover more square metres, you need bigger panels. The amount also changes depending on distance to the sun, and it drops off pretty quickly due to the inverse square law. Also, different types of star have different amounts of energy they output as well. Maybe solar power doesn't suit the type of craft you're making. Perhaps it needs more power than solar can provide, or is intended for use further away from a star. For that, you need to bring your own power source, which can be one of many things. Combustibles are the most simple form, and can be used to run a generator or as propellant for rocket engines. You may think that you always have to bring the fuel for these along with you, but that just isn't true. Hydrocarbons like methane can be found out there, like the big lakes of the stuff out on Titan. You can also crack water from mined ice into hydrogen and oxygen using a different slow power source like solar and then burn that in a rocket engine. I can't say how efficient that is or if there really is a good use case for that, but it is possible. Next up is nuclear power, which ultimately comes down to being a dense, long-lasting heat source. The smallest and simplest nuclear power source is the Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator, or RTG. As their nuclear fuel undergoes radioactive decay, it produces heat. On the outside of the RTG are radiator fins to create a cold side, and between those and the hot fuel are a bunch of thermocouples, which generate voltage thanks to the temperature difference. The power they output tails off as the radioactive fuel decays, but that takes a very long time, so these have seen plenty of use for long-term probes like Voyager or Perseverance. A step up in complexity from those are full-on nuclear reactors, which use controlled nuclear fission chain reactions to release a huge amount of thermal energy that can be used by the same thermodynamic cycles from earlier to generate power, or can be used to directly heat up propellants just like the solar heat I mentioned earlier. I will cover these nuclear thermal rocket engines in detail in future, since they're one of the best near-future options for engines we have. Subscribe now for that next month. The biggest downside is the radioactivity of the reactor when it's active, requiring heavy shielding and or lots of distance from the rest of the ship's components to protect it. They also need radiators even when not active, since the radioactive decay never stops. Despite these problems, a small number of nuclear reactors have been sent into space during the Cold War, though there hasn't really been any missions since then that would justify using them, in large part thanks to the rapid rise in capability of photovoltaics. 
while they do need an awful lot of industrial processes to acquire and refine, nuclear fuels can be found out there on other bodies like the Moon. In fact, there's more than double the amount of potential generatable energy up there in the form of fissionables than potential fusion fuels like the much overhyped Lunar Helium-3, which I've ranted about before in a short. Fusion is the next step up from fission in terms of potential energy density. Using magnetic or inertial confinement to fuse fusion fuels is humanity's current gold standard for potential energy generation, but it's really difficult to do, let alone get more power out of it than was put into it. If that is achieved, the energy can be captured either through the good old thermodynamic cycle route or directly via various electrostatic or electromagnetic methods that are too complicated to explain right now. And like everything else I've talked about today, it can be used directly in fusion engines, which I've talked about previously. The final option is antimatter, which are particles with the opposite charge to normal matter. There is an immense amount of energy released when particles and antiparticles touch and mutually annihilate, mostly in the form of gamma rays or subatomic particles that decay into gamma rays. It's extremely difficult to use these for power generation, but it is possible to use them as a catalyst for fission or fusion. Antimatter has many issues though, such as storage. It has to be held using magnetic or static fields within a vacuum, and you're screwed if power to the containment field runs out completely. The other big problem with antimatter is how incredibly rare it is. Antiprotons are created when high energy cosmic rays hit the upper atmospheres of planets, which then collect in the magnetic field, but there's still very little of it, on the order of nanograms a day at best, with more at gas giants. It is possible to produce it in particle accelerators, but those are going to be even slower. An entirely different method of power generation is to just generate it somewhere else and transfer it remotely, through something like microwaves or laser beams. You can even do this with kinetic energy by catching things that were dropped from higher up in a gravity well. I'm glossing over this a bit, so it may come back in a future video, but for now we gotta move on to the other side of the coin for power. Storage. Your power source may not be available all the time, or peak power draw exceeds production, and that is where storage comes in. All fuels are a way of storing energy for later use, but you can't really recharge them. An exception to this is a hydrogen fuel cell, which outputs water, which can then be cracked back out into hydrogen and oxygen to be reused. A handy thing to include when you need both oxygen and water in your life support system anyway. The most common type of electrical storage is of course the battery, and there's a huge array of them out there with all sorts of pros and cons. Lithium ion batteries are really good these days and are in use aboard the ISS, but there are shiny new things in the near future like solid state batteries which are promising to be much more power dense. Vaguely related to these are capacitors and supercapacitors, which are less power dense but can release their stored power extremely quickly. Another interesting energy storage method is the electric eel. Sorry, I mean superconducting magnetic energy storage, which as the name suggests, stores energy in the magnetic field that whirls around a hollow torus of superconducting coil. They charge and discharge extremely quickly and efficiently and do not lose power over time. The big downside is that all superconductors we know of only work at cryogenic temperatures, so lots of cooling equipment is required. The torus also needs strong reinforcement since all the electromagnetic forces inside it want to push apart from each other. An alternate way of storing power is to convert it to a different type of energy like rotational kinetic energy found in flywheels. The very best ones sit in vacuum and have magnetic bearings, done to reduce frictional losses as much as possible. They're used down here on Earth for temporary power storage, such as in the Gerald R. Ford class carriers as part of their electromagnetic aircraft launch catapults. Flywheels haven't yet seen use in space for power storage, but they have been used for decades as part of attitude control systems in the form of reaction wheels and control moment gyroscopes. While a power source may not be quite as exciting as the armament of a warship, it is far more important. Everything on a ship needs energy from somewhere, even the crew who need food. Hopefully this introduction has sparked a bit of interest or inspiration for this foundational system of any spacecraft. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our frigate and space fighter design reference books. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.